What's up everybody? It's Travis here from Travis.media. So as of 2023, I've now been in the software industry for eight years. Since learning to code at 34, up to the present, it's been eight years. And I wanna announce in this video that I'm finally hanging it up. Just kidding. In this video, I wanna give you eight things that I've learned as a self-taught developer that I think will help you on your journey. And that's it, I don't have anything else special to talk about, so let's get started. Number one, learn to push back. Be a developer that pushes back kindly when necessary. The client often wants things done to their site or their app that just isn't wise. To them, it looks good, or it keeps them in step with their competitors, or it's some plugin that they like that they just wanna play around with. It's your job not only to do the coding, but it's your job to say, no, that's a bad idea. Or why would you want to do that? That doesn't help you in such and such way. It affects the app negatively. It hinders performance. It's overly complicated and is going to require a big redo of this section of the site. It's up to you to step up and say that. Valuable developers push back. Replaceable developers, they agree to everything. The client wants something done, sure, I can do it. Whatever you need, I can do it. But coding is only half the job. They hire you for your wisdom. You know behind the scenes whether something is wise or unwise, and you're being paid to speak up about it. When I started out, I was that kind of developer. I was an agree to everything developer because my thought was, hey, the client wants me to do something. They're paying me to do it, just do it. And then the app got wrecked. Things started breaking and the client's like, why are things messed up? And I realized, hey, the client just wants to see results. They don't know what it takes. They're actually hiring me not just to write the code and implement the things, but to let them know whether it's a good idea or not. They often don't know that. They need you to push back when needed. So when the request comes in and it's a very bad idea, from a technical perspective, you need to push back or at least bring it up. Don't just agree to it. Number two, don't hide behind questions. With software engineering, you need to be precise. When someone assigns you work, you need to know the ins and outs of what's required before you can successfully execute that task. When I first started out, I wanted to look smart too. I didn't want people to think that I didn't know what I was doing. So I didn't ask questions. Everybody else was getting it. I should get it too. I'll just figure it out later. But that really hurt me in the long run because when a task was given me and there were particular things about it that they thought I understood, and I agreed saying, yeah, yeah, I got it. I really didn't get it. I should have been like, hold on, what do you mean by this? Or what do you want to do about this thing? I should have raised more questions to the point where when I sign off, hey, I'm good to do it, I fully understand it. And you, if you're a new developer, a junior, maybe even a mid, you might feel the same way. You might feel like you want everybody to think you're also a good developer so you don't ask questions, but it really hinders your growth. And here's an example. And I've told this before in one of my older videos, but I think it's a really good example. A couple of years back, I got put on this project. Everybody on the project was from the same company as me, except for one guy, he was brought in from another company. He was young, he's pretty smart, but he asked a lot of questions. And it made many of us uncomfortable. Like, why does this guy keep asking questions? Like during stand-up, they would get to him and they'd be like, hey, so-and-so, here's the task we need for you to be working on this week. It involves such and such and they'd go over the steps. And he would always say something like, wait, wait, go back. What was the last part again? I, I, don't, I don't understand how you'd even do that. And it would get the team talking and then they'd talk to him and he'd figure it out. Or he would say something like, why are they gonna use that technology? That's not a good idea. They should use Python or something like that. Or he would say, why are they even doing this? This isn't a good idea. We should push back and we should tell them that we shouldn't do this for such and such reason. And many of us were just like, come on, man, this meeting has gone too long and you're still talking, I thought. But I found out later that many of the questions he was asking are the questions that many of us wanted to ask, but didn't at the risk of looking stupid. We felt like we wanted to be smart developers. We got it, you can assign me something, I'll figure it out, I'll do a good job. But this guy, he's asking too many questions. But what he was doing was he was clarifying exactly what needed to be done. And often his discussions led to further discussions with the team where someone could put him on the right track or he would expose some reason why we shouldn't do that and the rest of the team would be like, hey, that's a good idea. And it actually worked out well. And he wasn't asking too many questions. I was just used to not asking any questions. And by the end of that contract, he was seen as a very reliable, capable DevOps engineer and actually got an offer from a company that was on the project for like way more than he was making. He didn't take it for some other reasons. But anyway, the point is that he didn't hide behind questions and you shouldn't either. You should have a clear picture of what needs to be done. If you don't know how to do something, say it. Ask more questions, ask the team so that they can help you do the exact job you need to do. Now, don't be annoying about it. 
You do have skill. You can figure things out on your own. You don't want to annoy people, but just don't be shy. Don't be the guy in the stand-up that's quiet the whole time. And then at the end, he's like, see you guys. Ask questions. Number three, learn to read documentation well. There's so many technologies out there. You can't learn them all. You can't learn all the languages and all the frameworks and all the other little things you need to use in your daily job. Instead, you can become very good at reading documentation. So if somebody says, hey, we need you to do such and such with Splunk, and you've never used Splunk before, you can go read the documentation. What is Splunk? How does it work? Like what's a diagram, an overview of how it works? And then dive into the individuals and find the specific need you have. If it's a framework like React, go to the React documentation. How does React work? Maybe there's a getting started guide where you can do like a quick sample project to see how it works. And the way to get better at reading documentation is just doing it. You'll get better over time because you'll have to do it anyway, but try to find some apps that have good documentation. How is it laid out? Is there an example app? Is there a conceptual diagram of how it works overall? What are the parts that make up that technology? Spend some time with that, and as you get better at reading documentation, you'll realize it'll really help you level up as a developer and get things done faster. Number four, be mentally and emotionally prepared to drink from the fire hose, especially those getting into DevOps and site reliability engineering, where you're in some new technology every day, it seems. Like I said previously, there's so many technologies to learn, it feels sometimes like you never actually learn anything. You're just jumping from one thing to the next. When you finally think you get something, you're pushed to some other technology. In fact, I was just talking to a friend of mine the other day who just got into DevOps that feels the same way. He told me, there are so many things to learn, and every couple of days I get pushed to some other technology to integrate that I feel like I never have time to settle down and learn anything. How do you do this? And here was my answer. It's a two-part answer. One, get good at reading documentation. We just talked about that. That's critical to these kind of jobs. But number two, realize it just takes time. And what happens is over time, you start to connect concepts. So if you're on a project and you're using Linux a lot, and you start to really understand the Linux CLI and the Linux file system, when they move you over to integrating Splunk or Datadog or something like that, and you have to do it on a Linux machine, you've already learned Linux over here. So you get over here, you're connecting that Linux experience with another task that's your task to do. If you understand CI, CD and AWS, and you set that up, then somebody wants you to come over to Google Cloud and set up that same thing. You have that concept understood already. You just need to know how to do it on Google Cloud. If you understand how OIDC works or how SAML works, it doesn't matter what platform you're on or where you do that at, it works the same regardless. So what I'm getting at is it just takes time. You're gonna have to drink from the fire hose. You're gonna have lots of technologies coming at you. And as you successfully figure each out, you're gonna start grasping all of these concepts that are gonna connect in the future as a year, two years goes down the road to where when you're put on this new task, you're able to nail it quicker. And you don't feel like you're drinking from the fire hose. I felt like that in the past, but now I don't. I feel more confident in my abilities to read documentation and to rely on my past skill sets that I've picked up along the way. Number five, taking breaks can be the best thing for your success. And I know this is so cliche and so many people say it, just get up and walk away and come back and the answer's there. I know so many people say that, but it's so true. If you're working on something and you're just like grinding the gears and you can't figure it out and you're hitting the button and you're just trying over and over to get this thing to work and you can't, really, just get up, go take a walk around the building, go take lunch, go talk to a friend, go do something else for a little while. You'd be amazed how much coming back with a fresh mind helps. Now it's good often to kind of wipe out a little bit of what you were working on instead of getting up to that point where you can't get any further and then coming back and starting at that point, just kind of go back a couple of steps, take a break, come back, redo those steps with a clear mind. Trust me, this is a top notch tip. Number six, be a conceptual programmer. Realize that programming concepts themselves can guide you through many different languages and technologies and frameworks, even if you've never used them before. If I understand functions, how functions work, parameters, arguments, things like that, doesn't matter what language I'm in. I know how a function works. If I understand loops and I understand objects and all of that, it doesn't matter what language I'm in. I just need to look up the syntax. And one thing that really helps with this is pseudocoding. Pseudocoding is like writing out in plain English or whatever language, writing out in plain English 
how I'm gonna do this. So they've given me some task, I'm gonna grab a piece of paper, and I'm gonna write the steps out in plain English. Like, I'm gonna do this first, then I'm gonna do this, then I need to loop through these things and find this one. I'm gonna write it all out. And because I'm a conceptual guy, I can conceptualize how I'm gonna do this and then figure out how I'm gonna do it with that language. This allows me to work in C-sharp one day and then react the next day and then Golang the next day, whatever it is. If I can use pseudocode to figure out how to do it, Plainly, I can then take those concepts and figure out how to do it specifically in that language. This also applies to concepts like MVC, Model View Controller, or even like OAuth2 authorization. The concepts are the same no matter what environment you're in. So number six, be a conceptual programmer. It allows you to jump around. Number seven, be humble. The worst person in the whole world is a cocky developer who is always right and has no patience. I've worked with these developers in the past. One example is a number of years back, I had to work on a project with this guy that was right out of college. He just got his computer science degree. He had his little clicky keyboard and his awesome mouse and his little 3D printer and everything. And there I was like 35 with my wired mouse trying to figure things out. So we got put on a project and we had to like code together in one of these shared sessions. And he just had no patience for me. Like I, I would be like, all right, I'm going to set up a function and I'd be writing it out. And then he'd say, ah, let me get the mouse. Let me take control of the mouse. I can't take this anymore. You're taking too long. And he would get it and he'd start typing and just had no time for me. He was always frustrated. In all the meetings, he was just telling everybody what to do and nobody liked him. And he didn't like me. I was very nice to the guy, but he was just always frustrated and just thought he knew everything. And he didn't stay long at the company. I don't know what he's doing now, but those kind of developers nobody likes. You want to be a developer that's humble and good. You don't have to prove yourself. People see it in your work and you're enjoyable to be around. Be a humble developer, not a cocky developer. And number eight, and this is a simple tip to those who are struggling with landing that first job. Remember this, keep this in the front of your mind. Do what it takes to get your foot in the door. Your first programming job doesn't have to be a good one. It doesn't have to be with Google. It doesn't have to be with some amazing company. Do what it takes to get your foot in the door. Take whatever job will hire you as a programmer. Once you're in there, Put in the work for a little amount of time at least to get that on your resume. But once you're in, it's easy to move somewhere better or somewhere else you'd rather be. Do what it takes to land that first job. And that's all I got today, guys. If you found it helpful, give me a thumbs up, consider subscribing to the channel, and I'll see you in the next video.